by 10. Um, and now we are going to hear from Jonathan Anderson, who I've known for quite a while now. That's a little scary, Jonathan. Anyway, but I have. Um, I feel bad because you saw one of Jonathan's own artworks on the invitation. But if I'd been thinking, uh, we would have taken my son's um, art explorations down and put up Jonathan's work, which we have. But we didn't do that, so on another occasion. Um, at least you got to see one on the invitation. But Jonathan has decided he likes thinking and writing more than he likes creating art, which may be a great loss to the art world in one way, but a great boon to the art world in another. Um, he has, he is presently, I've got to look at this to get your proper titles, Jonathan. He is a presently postdoctoral associate of theology and the visual arts at Duke University. Um, prior to that, he was an associate professor of art at Biola University for 11 years, and he is a graduate of the Tory Honors Program at Biola, which makes me very happy. And uh, since we were kind of involved in getting it started, so it's nice to see that, the, that it was worth it. Anyway, that is always, uh, what can I say? Uh, well, I already said it. Um, he also got uh, an MFA from Cal State Long, um, Long Beach, and he recently just flew through his dissertation to get his PhD at King's College, University of London. So he's, uh, he's been doing work, just not painting. But it's, as I said, a boon to the uh, art world in a very um, important way. He's also the co-author with William Durness, who taught for many years at Fuller Seminary, of the book Modern Art and the Life of a Culture, The Religious Impulses of Modernism. I encourage you to stick with it. It's worth it. Someone told me she started it tonight and couldn't understand. And, and I said, well, maybe after you hear Jonathan, it will help you um, to understand. But you kind of need to know what's going on before you read the book. But it's a wonderful book. At least I thought so. I did read it. It was one of the top 10 books in 2016 for image. Howard, that I think you need have how much have you had to drink? Anyway, I don't know. Or did it all end up on your shirt? I don't know. <laughs> You're dangerous. Yeah, well, I knew that. Okay. It stop. Okay. Um, it was one of the top ten books in 2016 by Image Journal, major journal of the arts and religion. It was the 2017 Book of the Year um, Award of Merit in Culture and the Arts from Christianity Today. And in 2019, it was shortlisted for the uh, um, Art and Christianity Book Award. So somebody was able to read it, and they thought it was very good. And I agree with them. So that's us. Um, he's, uh, he's written several articles and book chapters, including one that I, I also read and thought was pretty wonderful called The Invisibility of Theology and Contemporary Art Criticism, and the in is in parentheses, and, uh, and, and, a, and a section on modern art for the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Religion published last year. Jonathan is trained as a theologian, an artist, and an art critic, and I think the fact that he's also a very good artist lends insight into his ability to look at art and think about how art, religion, and culture all come together. And I'm really thankful just to know him. And Natalie, can I tell him your, no. Okay, they have really, okay, it's really wonderful news. It's made everyone I tell happy. So Jonathan and his, his wonderful wife, Natalie, who um, is a, a psychologist, um, also a graduate of the Tory Honors Program, um, have been married for 20 years, and they just recently are having their very first baby, and they're very excited. Yes! Yes! The surprise human. Yes, okay. 
Howard, Howard is very concerned because Howard was born 17 years after his parents were married and several people were disinherited because he was born. And, <laughs> and it made life difficult for Howard later on. So he's, he's concerned to know if this baby is, but I, Howard, Howard, you just can't see yourself in everyone, okay? You just have to, you know, Keep it inside. Yeah, all right. You're going to be universally outside pretty soon. I just want you to know. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, all right. Okay. There's two of them. Um, I try to hold things together, but it's a hard battle. At any rate. Okay. You may go outside with your father. It'd be fine. Okay. I, oh, dear God. Anyway, and we should pray probably at that point. Um, actually, uh, so it's great. So Jonathan is now going to talk to us about theology and modern art. And, uh, and I know it's going to be great. So, and then after that, I have a couple more things to, oh, to share with you. So, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction, um, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. I've I've uh, attended many of these in the audience as an audience member, so it's such a pleasure and honor to uh, be be speaking uh, here. Um, so, I, I mean, in some ways, what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, part of the reason for uh, abandoning my painting studio for the, um, what, for the laptop, I don't know what, for, for the uh, uh, lectern. Um, and, and that is that, that there, there was a, there is a certain breakdown in speech um, um, that created asymmetries between what was happening in artist studios and what was happening in art history textbooks and in uh, art history seminar rooms and, and so forth. So I'm going to uh, uh, talk about that uh, a bit uh, tonight, maybe at too much length indeed. Um, uh, so, uh, so the canonical, to just jump right into that, um, the canonical histories of modern and contemporary art have been written largely without serious consideration of religion. Um, this doesn't mean that religion was absent or irrelevant, um, quite the contrary, I think. Um, but for various reasons, it became inaccessible in the dominant discourses, in the speech, and in the writing about art, especially art made within the last 170 years or so. And this creates a really strange situation. Um, uh, religious traditions have deeply shaped uh, many major 20th and 21st century artists and artworks and the cultural context in which those are circulated and received. But when one turns to the art historical scholarship about these periods, one finds religion playing little or no role in writing and teaching about these artists and artworks. And there are many examples that we could explore there, um, and several good reasons why this is the case, actually. Um, but that's a different lecture. <laughs> so, um, and of course, this has not gone unnoticed by art historians. There are several influ influential scholars from Harold Rosenberg to Rosalind Krauss, who have acknowledged it over the years in their own ways. And perhaps the most, um, uh, most directly, in 2004, the prominent art historian James Elkins published a short book called On the Strange Place of Religion in Contemporary Art. And the strangeness he's referring to there is that religious concerns and conceptualities are uh, actually quite um, Common. They're quite frequently in play in contemporary art, but the methods, theories, and narratives that have structured, as he says, the grain of the history of modernism and criticism have rendered this content mostly uninterpretable and therefore functionally invisible in the ways that contemporary art is once again written and spoken about. Um, 
so uh, in a lot of ways, religion is exactly what modern and contemporary cannot be about. <laughs> and uh, so when it does show up, it does so uh, presumably as something vestigial or ironic or critical, uh, object or, or uh, medium of critical comment. Um, and to per push further into that topic, um, in, in uh, academic art context, um, is, in the words of Rosalind Krauss, indescribably embarrassing, uh, signaling that you don't really understand what modernism is or how it works. And thus, uh, if you haven't understand modernism, you ha you, uh, you don't, you're not understanding contemporary uh, art. And as Elkin, Elkin summarizes, religion might well have a place in contemporary art, but, quote, it does not have a place in talk about contemporary art. And again, sorting out uh, how and why that's the case is absolutely fascinating, but that's also a, another lecture. And I should say that uh, James Elkins is speaking there descriptively, not pros prescriptively. Uh, he, he actually is very interested in um, cultivate. In fact, he concludes his book by saying there's no way to, it's impossible, in, in his words, it's impossible to uh, talk sensibly about art and religion, but it's, uh, it's also irresponsible not to keep trying to do so. So he's, he's speaking descriptively and, um, rather than prescriptively. And if one spends much time shuttling between artist studios, departments of art history, and academic art libraries, one soon encounters precisely this strangeness. Many prominent artists are thinking quite seriously about religion, spirituality, theology, including many who are not themselves religious, right? <laughs> um, and I've talked to a lot of them in their studios, some of them. Uh, and their works uh, address these topics in various and uh, often quite sophisticated ways. But when one moves to the writing about these artists, this aspect of their work uh, tends to receive only cursory thinking or simply disappears altogether as serious critical analysis gets channeled through the more well-developed critical models. Um, and I finished my MFA in 2004 when Elkins published this book, and I, I think uh, it carried quite a lot of descriptive force for me uh, and, and my, my own experience there, and I think it still quite, carries quite a bit of descriptive uh, power today, um, but all of this has really been shifting in recent years. Um, with, a, with a remarkable increase in attention to religion and spirituality in contemporary art, among scholars, uh, artists and scholars alike. And this attention tends to be dispersed across radically different interpretive priorities, assumptions, even vocabularies. Uh, and so it, it is often quite confusing and maybe a little slightly chaotic. Um, in a wonderful way, I'm an artist, I sort of like it, chaos, but, um, uh, and it tends to proceed in a fairly episodic and ad hoc kind of way, um, often lacking a sustained interdisciplinary discourse that holds up well as both scholarship of art and scholarship of religion, or scholarship of theology, if that, if that makes any sense. So there's a lot changing, but, um, um, uh, we're still working out how to s speak well about it in non-embarrassing ways, uh, we might say. Uh, so, it, so that's the subject of this talk, um, to offer a kind of field guide to this changing discourse of contemporary art and religion, um, focusing especially on the years since uh, Elkin's book. Uh, so I'll try to end with a very brief proposal about how this... Um, uh, might benefit from more concentrated and well-developed study of theology in the history of uh, and uh, criticism of contemporary art. But for the most part, my aim here is descriptive, um, like Elkins, um, an attempt to provide a kind of provisional mapping of uh, this, this <laughs> chaotic terrain. Um, so to begin with, um, it's become... Um, uh, religion has become much more visible in contemporary art. So we'll look at two uh, kind of aspects of this. 
religion is becoming more visible in contemporary art, it's also becoming more discussable. Uh, I'm going to focus on the discussable uh, part, because that is Elkin's concern. Um, but I want to uh, briefly, far too quickly, uh, uh, sort of point at a ver various ways in which um, it's, uh, religion is becoming more visible in contemporary art, and thus forcing the questions. Um, and there really are a lot of artists who are making work that, in, that directly engages religious imageries and contexts and concerns, points of reference, and doing so from a lot of really different perspectives. A handful of examples, uh, Jan Vo, a um, Vietnamese-born Danish artist, um, uh, is interested in the kind of compromised role of religion, particularly Catholicism, in uh, European life. Uh, here are two examples. Oma Totem is a stack of objects that the artist's grandmother uh, received from a Catholic refuge um, uh, relief program when she arrived in Berlin from Vietnam. Uh, the stack includes a washing machine, a refrigerator, a 26-inch television, a personalized casino card, and a large wooden crucifix. Vo's uh, grandmother is Catholic, so this isn't simply about imposition. Um, uh, these, are, these are gifts. Um, uh, and, and by presenting them or representing them as a kind of totem, Vo prompts us to consider how, how this particular amalgam of values works. Uh, Christmas Rome on the right uh, are, consists of velvet fabrics that for years lined the exhibition vitrines for sacred objects in the Vatican. Um, and as the velvet has been bleached out by the exhibition lights, uh, uh, we're left with these kind of ghostly impressions of the displayed objects. They, uh, and so they operate kind of as an uh, after image of, a, of Catholic history and Catholic society. And there are lots of, Vo has lots of interesting works um, that repeatedly are engaged with uh, Catholic material culture, really. Uh, this uh, one is called Untitled. It's a six-part artwork in which Vo cut a medieval German sculpture of St. Joseph. I'm feeling closer to St. Joseph these days. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, in which he cut the sculpture of St. Joseph into six pieces, each cut to fit into the carry-on luggage requirements for EasyJet. So it's this kind of, he's interested in these collisions of systems, a deep religious uh, history colliding with another kind of system, um, like that uh, emblemized in the EasyJet. <laughs> um, passenger requirements. <clears throat> and so it throws into collision these kind of jarring, it's like jarringly throws into uh, collision these, this Christian heritage and uh, priorities of globalized contemporary life. Um, a few more that I'll run through too quickly. Chris Martin similarly uses, or Chris Martin, he's, he's Belgian, but we'll anglicize it into Chris Martin. Um, uh, similarly uses Christian artifacts, but often with a more existential set of questions. Uh, this is uh, called a festum uh, that is a garland um, strung together of hundreds of found uh, crucifixes um, that have been removed from their crosses, forming a kind of a garland that is a destabilizing merger between these holy devotional images and party decor. Again, these kind of jarring um, collisions of uh, maybe different uh, priorities. Or also, I mean, these are presumably disused crucifixes, so we could read it as a kind of, you know, um, uh, artifacts of past belief or something. But also, I mean, Martin tends to do something a lot more than that. Actually, the festival, the celebration, the, there's always a kind of eschatological horizon of open in his work uh, that I think is very interesting. It's certainly open in this work um, called Altar that is 
It might be running a little slow, the slides, because the it's kind of a huge PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, this is called Alter, which is the empty frame of the Ghent Alter piece that is exhibited outside, always in outdoor locations, so that it becomes a kind of elliptical aperture. Oh, I mean, maybe, so once again, maybe it's a skeleton of a past Christian uh, culture uh, that is stalking around in the landscape, or maybe it is still a functional elliptical aperture, a, a eschatological aperture. If any of you know what the Ghent altarpiece. Um, uh, yes, indeed. Very good. Um, I'm going to run through a bunch of others really too quickly. Andrea Butner is a German artist who uh, was shortlisted for the prestigious Turner Prize about five years ago. Uh, so these are all really prominent artists. Um, uh, and she repeatedly collaborates with um, communities of Carmelite nuns uh, in these really wonderful videos that are um, uh, also exploring kind of um, tra tra traditional Catholic um, practices under various kinds of pressure. Um, so this one is called Little Sisters. Here is a group she collaborated with uh, called Carmel Dachau. It's the um, group of Carmelites that live and practice immediately next to the Dachau concentration camp. That's a powerful film, I think. Um, and, uh, and then she's also very interested in uh, iconographies of um, uh, poverty, uh, drawing especially from Franciscan theology and Simone Weil and various other people who can help her think of, uh, through uh, theologies of poverty. You might have to advance these. I don't know that this is working. You can go one more. Thank you. <laughs> um, Dina Lawson. Um, is uh, consistently uh, reprocessing familiar Christian iconographies through an African or African-American visual vernacular. This is uh, clearly a Madonna. Um, and uh, uh, she does similarly with um, Adam and Eve and so on. And again, these are showing in the Whitney. I mean, this isn't, uh, um, these are visible. Um, uh, Arthur Jaffa is a, um, uh, a filmmaker who won the Golden Lion Award at uh, a recent Venice Biennale for this work called Love is the Message, the Message is Death. Um, that is all of these, he, he approaches YouTube as a kind of collective unconscious, a visual unconscious that he sort of mines specifically for the, you know, um, representation of black people. And it is um, this sort of um, uh, fast-paced uh, clips of uh, images from black church and uh, athletes and so on, violence. Um. And it got so much attention that he responded to this work this is short and very fast paced. He responded to it with a very long <laughs> video work. It's about an hour and 40 minutes that consists entirely of um, uh, clips of, of uh, sermons and worship services from black churches. And it's a very powerful video, I, uh, I find, called A King Done Cometh As. Um, uh, just a couple others. Uh, uh, that is not Dina Lawson. That's, that's Genesis Tremaine. Um, and I'll just kind of run, run through these. Uh, Hussein Valamenish uh, is influenced by Sufi Islam, and a lot of uh, his work is in dialogue with that, and so on. I feel like I'm uh, uh, choosing somewhat at random. There's just uh, so many artists to point to here. Uh, in which there are very substantive engagements with religion in their work. Um, and we could name a, a number of others. Theaster Gates, Ayalisa Akhtila, uh, Zara Hussein, Francis Elise, Patty Wickman, Lynn Aldrich, and so on. Um, 
And many artists are um, placing major works in um, either temporarily, uh, temporary or permanently in churches and synagogues. And this is a very, I keep a running list of these, and it's a very long list indeed. Um, here's a Louise Bourgeois, uh, the Saul LeWitt work at the Stolm, uh, uh, um synagogue is this wall. He just, it divides the synagogue and it is, you hear the prayers, the holy prayers uh, singing from the other side. Uh, Sean Scully um, uh, uh, and so on. Gerhard Richter, James Terrell, so on. And in the past two decades, uh, there have also been um, several major exhibitions addressing religious content and questions, again, from really different positions. Um, uh, 100 Artists See God, uh, Seeing God is that middle one, Belief, which was the first um, Singapore Biennale, and uh, just to point at a bunch of these, um, a little help back there. <laughs> I must be a little far away. Um, and these are ranging across all sorts of topics and ways of thinking about the uh, subject of religion, spirituality, and so on. Uh, one more. We'll look at a couple of these in more depth, but just to throw them out there. Um, and this signals some of the ways that religion has not only become more visible, but also become more discussable in contemporary art. Um, a groundswell of books, essays, conferences, exhibition catalogs have appeared over the past two decades that are devoted to precisely this kind of talk about religion in relation to contemporary art and then the modernisms from which it grew. N none of this is to suggest that uh, artists are themselves religious, these artists or the curators in any straightforward way, some of them are. Um, nor is it to suggest that religious beliefs and practices are simply returning in traditional forms. Uh, artists and scholars are returning to the topic and even the questions of religion and doing so in serious ways. Um, uh, but the forms that are now in view and the ways in which the central questions are framed are, uh, include a kind of array of uh, things going on. In the fast currents of what Z uh, Zygmunt Bauman called liquid modernity, um, religion is not disappearing as secularization theorists once thought. Um, rather, it too, for better or worse, is becoming more liquid in its capacities to ad adapt to different forms, <laughs> take different forms. And that is very much on view in the uh, in the arts, in the visual arts. So all of these uh, developments are interesting and interconnected, um, but I want to focus more narrowly on the ways that it's being written and talked about, um, which is Elkin's central concern. What are the primary questions that these artists and exhibitions and so on are asking, um, and what kinds of intelligibility are they trying to produce? Um, uh, so I want to organize this in an intentionally kind of simple way, um, um, but I, I think it will it provides a helpful mapping of of what's going on in contemporary art and religion. I want to propose that there are four horizons, interpretive horizons, within which religion is becoming visible, intelligible, and meaningful. In, in uh, the ways that uh, people are talking about contemporary art, thinking about contemporary art and religion. Um, little help. Uh, first one, there's an anthropological horizon, a political horizon, a spiritual horizon, and a theological horizon is what I want to propose. Um, initially, my uh, naming of these associates them with s vaguely with different disciplines, anthropology, maybe political theory, theology. Um, 
But that's not what I'm interested in is disciplines. Uh, all of these are in art history, we'll say. Uh, what I have in mind here is something more fundamental and encompassing than that. Uh, a, a hermeneutical horizon in which things, the world, in this case art, religion, show up as intelligible and um, in some way important for human life. And so the, this kind of fourfold um, um, taxonomy groups is intentionally simple and it's kind of heuristic. It's meant to um, clarify what's going on. Of course, there are numerous possibilities between these and uh, combinations of them. Um, but in almost every case, people are uh, finding one of these to be most fundamental, most descriptive of why art is meaningful. Uh, so I want to describe each of these briefly and uh, um, I'm particularly interested in that last one, but I do want to uh, map all of these briefly. And uh, we'll start with the anthropological. So there's a lot of scholars who are thinking about uh, art in religion, uh, or religion in art, at the, uh, relate, or the kind of intersection of art history and religious studies. And you can go forward here, I think. Um, and what they're interested in is the ways that art and religion are deeply entwined in the formations and functions of culture. They're arguing that you can't divorce these two. Uh, art is not really its own kind of sphere in r wider culture. Like there's this kind of notion that religion and art get divided into totally distinct spheres. And they want to argue, no, these are... These have to do with the ways that we imagine the world and the ways that we imagine our relationship to other people, doing it spatially or doing it um, uh, through the arts visually. Um, uh, and a few examples of this approach, uh, Eleanor Hartney, for example, who published the same year as James Elkins, notes how many prominent artists had Christian, particularly uh, Roman Catholic, upbringings. And she explores the ways in which there's a discernible Catholic imagination in play for these artists, including those artists who, like her, uh, left the faith at some point, um, but remained deeply shaped by it. Uh, other scholars like David Morgan and Sally Promi and Brent Plate and others um, argue that we need to pay closer attention to the ways that visual culture, religious visual culture, religious material culture, religious identity, and those sorts of things shape, shape the ways that contemporary art works, the ways it's produced, the ways that it's received, the ways it's interpreted. Um, that often uh, takes the shape of focusing on Christianity, but there are also um, uh, Similar studies happening around Buddhism, Islam to some extent, and especially Judaism. There's a lot of uh, uh, research into Jewish um, identity and so on. But generally from this kind of anthropological point of view, where it's not so much about getting inside of the, the not ad adopting the beliefs oneself and not doing so theologically, but trying to describe the ways that uh, art is shaped by Jewish practice or Catholic practice or what or whatnot. Uh, one more example: the um, uh, writing surrounding a large exhibition from 2015. Um, we'll go f forward. Uh, called "The Problem of God." How's that for an evocative title? Yeah, with a Chris Martin. Uh, a sculpture there called For Whom, an empty bell that swings on the hour without a clapper. Um, according to Isabella Maltz, the exhibition's curator, the aim was to trace the afterlife of Christian forms and symbols as they still circulate through Western visual imagination and through contemporary art more specifically. Um, despite what she considers an otherwise sort of total secularization. Um, but she's, she's interested in the ways that there's a, a kind of afterlife, uh, a, a Nachleben, uh, to, to borrow 
from Abby Vorberg. Her aim was to better understand, in her words, quote, the legacy of Christian imagery and cultural practices which, detached from their religious context, has flowed into secular life and proves to be as enduring, complex, and paradoxical a reference system in art as it ever was, end quote. Interestingly, Maltz told me that, the, that this was largely artist-driven. She decided to do the show because she had to do better justice to the fact that so many artists she knew and really respected were engaging the problem of God. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, and so there's a, the tangle of questions uh, that arises from the problem of God includes profoundly theological and spiritual questions, but in the writing surrounding the exhibition, the exhibition catalog and so on, it was almost entirely on the anthropological horizon. Uh, um, it, it, the, the question was in David Morgan's essay, for example, um, trying to come to terms with, quote, a compelling description of the sociology of art and religion as, a, as visual enterprises focused on the management of aura, sort of sacredness, which is, for him, socially produced and maintained. And that's what he's interested in studying. Okay, you get the idea. What anthropological? Okay, good. Um, in general, this is really interesting. A lot of the scholarship is really good. Um, I think I have one more from the exhibition. Um, a lot of it's really good, and there are a lot more exhibitions that I think stick entirely within this horizon. Um, but they proceed, in the words of one scholar, with the detachment of the observer rather than the attachment of the adherent. Um, so they, we take religion seriously as kind of socio-cultural force, but not as practices or beliefs one would want to inhabit as the viewer <laughs> or the uh, maker of these of such works. As a curator, a Philly, uh, Harry Philbrick notes, quote, when religion is broached, it is within some other critical context, heaven as a sociological construct, Mary as a gender symbol, Jewishness as a cultural condition, end quote. Okay, that's uh, anthropological. We'll look at a couple of these. Oh, there are lots of these. I mean, it's really prominent. And again, really fascinating exhibitions. Um, the second horizon is the political horizon. And in this horizon, a number of scholars take up those same anthropological categories, but they see them functioning almost entirely in terms of how power is generated in a society and how it, uh, it, it um, organizes a society. So in this uh, instance, um, the return of religion in contemporary art doesn't have much to do with faith or belief. It has to do with kind of tactical uh, um, repositionings uh, to find critical positions and resources for critique and resistance. Um, and so they're interested in art and religion as organizing how the sensible is distributed, as they say. <laughs> how visu visuality is built in a culture, and that means critiquing Art and religion together is, is the argument. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples without, you know, uh, spending too much time with them. Thank you. <laughs> uh, here are a few. Um, uh, Donald Preziosi is the most influential of those in the middle, um, who who argues in a really interesting way that the kind of secular division of art and religion, that these are two separate things, is this kind of, um, it conceals actually that they're profoundly codependent on each other. Um, uh, contemporary art needs religious metaphysics in order to mean, and it imports all sorts of religious metaphysics with, uh, while concealing it, and uh, religion needs artifice and art, art, artistry to uh, sort of mediate sacredness. And so he takes these together, 
But for him, that's not just an anthropological argument, it's profoundly political because this is how you, this is how power is organized in a society and so on. Or in his words, it reveals, critiquing these together, reveal, quote, how self-other relations are coordinated and controlled or disciplined in the service of the modern nation state. You get the extraordinary political kind of horizon that he's operating in. And there are a bunch of other scholars, T.J. Clark, Sven Lutekin, I won't uh, um, go into these. Um, they uh, often will take religion not, uh, well, in, maybe in more kind of serious terms as um, sites where there are political concerns that get worked out. So um, they help us to speak about fundamentally political struggles having to do with suffering and tragedy and hope and so on. Um, a lot of uh, um, exhibitions uh, fit in this vein. This one is called The Divine Comedy, which is a direct quote of uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. But then the subtitle is Heaven, Purgatory, and Hell, which reverses the order. So through the, through the <laughs> uh, exhibition, you sort of descend from heaven into hell, um, and it is, it is this, um, it is a power who has, who has power and the way that religion organizes power is the kind of overarching framework. Um, and here's a, several other exhibitions. The one on the end is quite interesting called Animism. It was a big show that traveled a, a lot, and it is thinking of animism as a sort of way of critiquing Western all forms of Western rationality. Okay, but you get the idea. Okay. Um, and I think that, that horizon, I should say, is, has been productive and insightful um, uh, because art and religion are political. Um, uh, but there are also really strong impulses toward reduction in a lot of these uh, works, I think, um, in, in such that religion and art and everything else gets ultimately transposed into questions of power. All questions get transposed into questions of power. Um, and that it, it also tends to rely on, on kind of accounts of religion that tend to be fairly religiously unmusical, as uh, to borrow a phrase from Max Weber. <clears throat> There's no music in the religion. Like, who? <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, uh, third, spiritual horizon. Um, within the spiritual horizon, uh, the kind of most salient questions are um, questions of how the arts and religion, I'll qualify that in a bit, have a potential to foster social, ecological, um, spiritual awakening. Um, and connectedness and re-enchantment of the world in the context of the disenchanting operations of secular modernity. The term post-secular is often used here um, um, as a, a kind of um, a position that has moved through secularism into a, into a position of being disenchanted with disenchantment kind of thing, <laughs> as Jeff, Jeffrey Kosky says. Um, this literature almost always includes political framings, but the argument is that, uh, yeah, that's good, uh, that politics are grounded in deeper spiritual crises that cannot be addressed through political struggle without more comprehensive spiritual transformation. And in this horizon, the main interest is that uh, um, art uh, can provides sites for this kind of transformation. And so it, it related to religion in the sense that art takes over a lot of tr religion's traditional roles for a lot of these scholars. <clears throat> um, in general, uh, scholars working in this horizon um, uh, make wide use of religious traditions, but they tend to avoid God language and they tend to avoid the term religion. 
Um, the spiritual is usually the key term here, and it shows up in all of these um, book titles. A wide range of approaches is possible within uh, this horizon, um, but a central, a common theme to a lot of them is in Lynn Gamwell's words, quote, a, ce a central thread woven into the fabric of modern art is the reformulation of theological questions in secular terms. On the one hand, a lot of uh, artists, curators, are seeking to recover a kind of mythic, transpersonal ground of being. That's really, um, um, that is a quote from Susie Gablick. Um, and uh, Sus uh, um, Charlene Spretnak gives a kind of whistle-stop tour of uh, the last two centuries of art, uh, sort of demonstrating the way that that's the case, Lisa Fanning, and so on. And these are also are really interesting. Lisa Fanning and all of these uh, artists uh, or scholars up here are, are uh, interested in Fanning's words in the way that the spiritual has, quote, a positive unifying function that serves to bridge differences and bring people together in beneficial ways. And a, a number of exhibitions uh, kind of work in this way. Um, sometimes pulling from religious traditions, Buddhism on the left, uh, Byzantine um, uh, theology in the middle, which is sort of odd. It kind of like interprets a lot of Byzantine work in conversation with contemporary art as all about animism, which is an odd, kind of an odd reading, but um, yes, of course, yes. Um, uh, let's go forward one. There we go. But of course, a positive and unifying are not the only terms correlated to the spiritual. In 2017, the exhibition As Above, So Below, um, Portals, Visions, Spirits, and Mystics, opened at the Irish Museum of uh, Modern Art in Dublin. According to the curators, the exhibition um, uh, originated as an open-ended meditation on the reinvention of spirituality that had to do with the kind of frustration of um, modernist myths of progress. But here the spiritual has less to do with positivity and unity than with radical disjunction. Um, in their words, it was a rangy and associative exhibition gathering together astral journeys and surrealism, tarot cards and shamanism, hallucinogens and demons, end quote. And a number of other exhibitions operate in a similar, there's a lot of um, um, occult, occult is having quite a comeback in contemporary art these days. Um, and these are all quite interesting. Um, they tend to be riddled with anachronism and um, equivocation when it comes to the religious traditions or spiritual traditions that they're borrowing from. Um, they tend to be intentionally unmoored and really unaccountable to any particular religious tradition, even as it appropriates their languages and uh, makes claims to a kind of underlying unity between all religions. Um, and I'll wrap up <laughs> here soon with a, the last horizon, uh, which is the theological. Elkins ends his 2004 book by saying that, quote, in a manner that is difficult to determine, the name God is still a part of the language of art even though the name has been set aside. End quote. And a growing number of scholars is pushing on that further, um, exploring the ways that questions of God and histories of understanding God's relation or non-relation to the world are live questions in modern and contemporary art, even if uh, often not named as such. Uh, these scholars generally affirm the other uh, horizons, the way that they work, um, but also argue that we're not... Uh, sort of coming to grips with religion without attending to the complex theological concerns and context and implicit theologics that's in play throughout those histories and throughout 
uh, a lot of art making. And of course, that, is, that could be quite implicit in the, in the ways that we talk about implicit politics of an artwork. Um, uh, artworks have implicit theologies or theologics that artists are rarely fully in control of and uh, they're not reducible to artists' conscious intentions. Um, uh, so a few examples here in the theological. From one disciplinary direction, there are many theologians and philosophers that have been writing about uh, modern and contemporary art and doing so from a range of positions. These are examples of those who are interested in a kind of death of God theology or God after God theology uh, that gets worked out in uh, contemporary art. Um, others see uh, contemporary art in more highly constructive dialogue with extended theological traditions, especially Christian and Jewish, but not exclusively. Uh, here are a handful. Uh, Melissa Raphael uh, has a fascinating book on Judaism and the visual image. Um, ben Quash isn't writing specifically about modern art but, and, or contemporary art, but uh, his ideas are so relevant to a, a theology, theology within contemporary art. And then I think I'm trying to work in this horizon as well. Um, from another direction, several art historians, so those were theologians who were writing about um, contemporary art. From another direction, there's a lot of art historians who uh, are arguing that a more rigorous theological inquiry is necessary for um, doing good art history, <laughs> including modern and contemporary art history. Um, to point out one of these uh, in his 2017 book, no Idols, The Missing Theology of Art, Thomas Crow uh, argues that the, quote, the reigning interdiction of theology in academic art history has created a blind spot in the study of 20th century art. Um, his uh, interest is not in studying religious art, rather he's interested in, quote, the strength of religious outlooks and convictions by the pressure they exert on ostensibly secular subjects and secular artworks. Um, and specifically, he's interested in idolatry and uh, counter-idolatrous, the sort of dialectic between idolatry and the critique of idolatry or idolaclasm. Um, and so he argues that in order to understand, whether it's creedal or not, uh, whatever, uh, to understand what's going on and what's at stake in a lot of contemporary art making, one has to engage in a, par as he calls it, a parallel theological reflection of our own that is a pursuit distinct from just parsing parochial issues of uh, religious observance in a period or in a culture. It's not just anthropological, in other words. And that's, that's quite interesting. It's quite an interesting book. A brave book, it is. It's quite a thing that Thomas Crow published that book. Um, a couple others, James Herbert, uh, thinking about distance, all sorts of distance as theologically, as having a kind of metaphysics of divine distance and presence. Uh, Johannes Rauchenberger um, has this huge three volume <laughs> thing, uh, that middle one, God has no museum, no museum has God, that is, uh, a kind of virtual museum, and so on. We could uh, talk about uh, many more, including exhibition catalogs or exhibitions, uh, as we've done with the others. Uh, uh, Fragments of a Crucifixion is an interesting example at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. That includes, I mean, it's about race and, and politics of race and religion, but it includes a really open theological horizon, including um, writing that is um, uh, bringing into view the way that black theologians are talking about Christology in the exhibition catalog. Um, several other uh, ex uh, exhibitions recently. Soul is a very interesting one, Seeing God. And of course, Hereafter. I mean, I, I think this is a significant exhibition, uh, that last one, um, that... Uh, 
um, doesn't collapse. None of these collapse down to a, only a theological horizon, but includes it as a as it must be. It must be accounted for and included to make sense of what's going on in these artworks. Um, and of course, to press the issue, if we go back to a lot of those previous exhibitions, um, the problem of God uh, is unavoidably a theological problem, even if it's not discussed or uh, thought through in those terms in the formal writing about it. Uh, other uh, exhibitions, medium religion, God and goods, uh, traces of the sacred, and so on. Uh, this scholarship, since I've critiqued briefly the others, uh, this scholarship is opening up significant avenues for further exploration, uh, but it tends to be methodic, me methodologically underdeveloped, um, either from the art historical side or the theological side, or sometimes both. Um, and that means it kind of has a propensity to uh, be too heavy-handed with the theology so that it is foisted upon artworks or overly generic so that it just stays in the clouds and doesn't talk about artworks. Um, uh, to conclude, we could see all, all in theory, all of these, oh, uh, I, I mean, I think bridge, uh, bridge projects has been exemplary in the ways that it has uh, opened a, a theological horizon in addition to the other horizons of, of discourse available in the contemporary art world. Um, now, none of these are mutually exclusive in, in theory. Um, one can uh, keep all of them in view. Uh, they do tend to um, pull in different directions and create uh, sort of conflicts and uh, contradictions that um, need careful thinking. Um, and one of the reasons I've called them horizons rather than methods or approaches is that they generally each function as a kind of fundamental hermeneutic, once again, a sense of, one's, of what matters in the world. Um, of the four, the fourth, the theological horizon, I think is currently the least developed, in, at least in the art world. And it's most contestable uh, within the art world. Thus, the bravery of Thomas Crowe to publish that book. In fact, uh, though, I think it's really this one that's at the heart of the strange condition of religion in contemporary art that Elkins describes. And it's also the one that I'm particularly interested in. Um, I think a more concentrated and well-developed mode of theological inquiry has much to contribute to the history, theory, and criticism of contemporary art without being reductive, but instead opening uh, much of what's going on in, in contemporary art. And so going forward, I do envision a mode of study that keeps all these horizons in view and a mode of discourse that keeps all these horizons in view um, while especially developing the potential for the modes of critical writing capable of addressing the theological conceptualities, genealogies, and implications that are in play in so, so much uh, art being made today. And that involves thinking be better from both directions developing concepts and capacities, skills, really, uh, where art criticism might operate with a more agile, historically sensitive understanding of religion and theology, a richer theological intelligence, and theology might operate with a more agile, historically sensitive understanding of art history and criticism, a, more, uh, a, a richer art historical intelligence, visual yeah. intelligence. And developing a scholarly discourse that thinks well from both of these uh, directions is a tall order indeed. And there are many challenges, but I think that's what needs further thinking uh, going forward. I'll stop there, uh, probably too long already. But thank you uh, so much for your attention. <laughs> Take questions. Uh, if any, if anyone does have questions, uh, I'm happy to.
uh, respond. <laughs> Happy to have a conversation. Yeah. We're reading a lot in the news about sort of theological or religious belief and faith sort of approaching a nadir in this country, or at least in Western civilization. Ah. And, it, and it seems to be that you're saying, in, in the secular realm, and you're saying that uh, I think I think you're saying that there's there's maybe some revitalization of interest in mm -hmm. theology in the realm of art. Can you explain sort of the tension between those oh, two apparent directions? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, well, I mean, I think it has I think it has a lot to do with the. I, I briefly alluded to uh, Zygmunt Bauman's idea of the of liquid modernity. Um, that the the idea he the, you know the idea is taken from Marx and Engels that uh, um, you know what what uh, um, modern modernity does and what capitalism does for Marx is to liquefy tradition in order to re um, mold to build new structures, so liquefy what's received in order to build a new world, new social relations, and so on. And what Zygmunt Bauman says is that the, the way that uh, modernity works is that it hasn't just built new structures, but it is becoming, it's turning into this kind of auto-liquefying, uh, so, that, so that what we are prioritizing is not building new structures, but um, lightness, speed, um, uh, superficial attachment, that kind of thing, so that we can move faster, change faster, change faster. And so he calls it liquid modernity. And I think, I think that is an illuminating idea. Um, and, it, in, and Bauman would say that that also is affecting religion, um, that it is, we're, we're kind of seeing not religion melting down in order to build new religions, but a kind of pl radical pluralization of religious and spiritual beliefs. Um, as uh, uh, um, Charles Taylor said, it's like a galloping pluralism on the spiritual plane. <laughs> a spiritual supernova is what he calls it. Um, and so, so I think that has um, uh, really... Um, that's linked to a lot of allergy toward organized religion or heavy religion, so on, um, that is widespread in the um, contemporary art world and in you know, culture more broadly. Um, but the, there's also an extraordinary allergy to um, a, a kind of... Uh, um, an all-encompassing, well, there's an extraordinary allergy to belieflessness or valuelessness or al allergy to, there's an allergy to liquid modernity itself. It's, it's what we love and hate at the same time. And so I think that's pressing, pushing a lot of people to try to find, go back into history and go back into reconnect with um, one's own spiritual yearnings in a lot of ways to um, to, to find something to find something deeper <laughs> so, something that something that uh, transcends the a, a kind of closed a closed the closed system closed materialist system I guess um, so I think that what that means is that you have you have both things happening at once somehow a proliferation of interest in religion, spirituality, and theology. Interestingly, this is a side note, I've had multiple really major artists um, tell me uh, in the last few years, I'm not interested in religion, and I'm not really interested in spirituality either, because it's too unmoored. When I say the spiritual, I don't, I'm, you know, it's, it becomes a private, uh, too private, too unmoored. Uh, religion's too heavy, spirituality is too unmoored, and they say, what I'm interested in is theology, which is very unexpected. But that is what they mean by that, is a traditioned, a, a traditioned deep uh, line of questioning 
for wrestling with the what uh, with the real. Does that does that help at all? <laughs> did I did I loop around your question enough? So I so I think there's all to say there. You know, yes. I'll, did that did that answer your question? It was a very good answer. Okay. I there's something in there about that. Um, allergy to religion, but yearning for what religion is supposed to signify, what it's, what it's after. And thus, I mean, interestingly, uh, spiritual, uh, those who identify with the spiritual have an allergy to religion. Theologians have always had an allergy to religion, too. I mean, you know, an allergy to religion isn't so bad. Karl Barth is like the, I mean, if you want scathing critique of religion, comes from the theologians. <laughs> it's Karl Barth or whoever, you know. Or Jesus. Or Jesus. <laughs> <clears throat> Good. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to me. It's, it's interesting to me that um, the uh, financial support for music and <clears throat> art um, a century ago came principally from the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, that has not, um, that influence has not disappeared. Ah, yeah, yes. Yeah, good. In, in, in some ways, it's resurging or re, uh, yeah, resurging. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I should, I should say, maybe I, uh, emphasized Catholic artists m most here, but um, I'm, I'm quite interested in, um, I think there are really profound engagements with Catholicism in contemporary art and with Protestant um, uh, a theology in contemporary art and Jewish and so on. I mean, there, there's, I think, and I'm, I'm really interested in that whole range. Yep, yeah. Good, Lynn. I always wanted to be a lapsed Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> because uh, when I was trying to figure out how to be an artist and bear yeah. the belief questions that were important to me, it seems like the Catholic tradition, because they already had a very material culture in yeah. a way yeah. that was vibrant, <laughs> And coming from a more text-oriented yeah. Protestant yeah. tradition and loving text and yeah. finding those questions uh, that you're attracted to is so important. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have a visual language from Protestantism yeah. that was very easy to connect to. Right. You know, or, and I think, I, well, the reason I kind of raised my hand is I, I wanted to say I think that we all know that contemporary art swings back and forth mm. in pendulums mm. of, oh, this will, we really think this is so important to look at. Oh, no, let's go look at yeah, this, yeah. you know. And in a way, that's one of its strengths because it remains fluid in yeah, that way. It, yeah. But I think that's one reason is that. Uh, yeah modernism and on into our recent more contemporary times we have uh, uh people are feeling this sense of we've already broken all the taboos <laughs> there are yeah yeah you know, we've already given yeah. all the angst to the world we can think of maybe we should try to find something affirmative yeah <laughs> and c.s lewis always said you know people love to yeah. say no to everything this isn't any this is uh, something we can't hmm. go to we can't ah. and to say yes is to make yeah. it affirmative is a very uh, risky yeah. thing to do in the that's, art world that's that you really know. interesting yeah that's that's really interesting but um yes. theology i think now one reason is as our technology gives us all this imagery of the cosmos hmm. you know and how so, you know, when I was in school, knowledge was all in doubt. You know, yeah. you can't know anything. Yeah. You can't, nothing's 
knowable. Nothing's truth. Yeah, yeah. And now, I think we're, well, this is just a personal observation, but I think that there's so much evidence for creation, <laughs> evidence for yeah, yeah. design and love and uh, uh, preparedness in uh, what we have uh, in yeah. our lives on this planet and what the universe is yeah. being revealed to be, that questions about it will theologically connect you to questions. Is there a God? Mm -hmm. I think it's just timely. Yeah, interesting. Well, uh, just to, re to respond uh, to uh, one of the things you said, I mean, so there, there are, uh, in, to some extent, the kind of new visibility of religion in contemporary art does have to do with this kind of auto transgression thing, right? Like I was recently reading an interview with the artist Matt Mulliken, in which they were asking him, "Why are you like why these religious, why these religious things that you're in your work right now?" And he's like, "Well, there was there were no other rules to break. Like the most embarrassing thing I could do was start dealing with religion. Like I could do anything with my body or like identity. Like that's not." That's not interesting. I was interested in uh, embarrassing myself, and like because that s signified something. Like I was, I was, I was touching something that was um, important. Yeah, um, not cool. So there's that. That goes on, and that's actually there are some interesting things. Like uh, Andrea Butner is really interested in shame and embarrassment, and religion is part of that in her work. Though she's, I think, very uh, thinking very deeply about it. But the other thing you said, so that it goes on. But I think there's also a, as you said, a um, so as really brief uh, backdrop that you already all know about. Um, the dominant critical methods that Elkins was talking about that made it impossible to talk sensibly about religion in contemporary art were all highly, highly suspicious. Um, modes of criticism, right? Where everything, uh, so through a, through a psychoanalytic lens, like anything you're saying about religion is really about desire and libido and um, subjugated desire and that kind of thing. And uh, through a kind of you know, neo-Marxist lens, anything you're saying about religion is really about power dynamics, and so on and so forth. So religious content just gets sort of, yeah, taken apart before it even really gets going. Those, all those critical methods have kind of run into the sand, as Hal Foster admits. And there is, a, there is an emergence of, of, um, of a, um, well, there's a, a, a literary theorist named Rita Felsky, who's writing about attachment and um, um, yes, saying yes to art. We've, we've been so highly suspicious of artworks that, as she said, what, how does she say it? Um, we've become so articulate about the deceits at work in art, and we're absolutely tongue-tied about our loves. We can't love in, in the art museum. Or at least if you do love, you can't speak openly about that. There, you have to enter a critical mode. And so she's talking about this kind of post-critical affective theory, attachment theory, that that's where we, what we really, um, what really gets us um, engaged with art are these yeses. And I think that does, even though uh, Felsky is a little nervous about, um, no, she's, she's open to talking to theologians. She's a little nervous about occupying that language herself. But uh, I think that those are really connected. Um, uh, um, the yeses, the deep yeses to the world are always theologically charged. That's a, that's a bold claim, but I think it's right. That doesn't necessarily mean that you just, you, you know, being uh, the yeses always need to get sort of organized, collated into a sort of doctrinal sort of structure, but there is the, the yes to the world that is a yes to some, um, to, to a you. 
<laughs> okay, I'm getting, that's kind of mystical. But you get it. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying. Yes, Roberta. Yeah. Um, the greatest artists did their work yeah. for um, places of worship and devotion. Yeah. And um, then there's Protestantism, which we could all talk about for well, some of us could talk about for years. Um, um, who that was iconoclastic in the Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. um, you had iconoclasm earlier. Yeah. Than that. of images, yeah. except for the Persians who kind of didn't get the memo and did do a few. Mm -hmm. um, so, we have, <laughs> uh, and so we have some pictures and then whatever. Um, what I have noticed in my own tradition is that Christians across the board, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, mm. have become visually aware of it. Uh, and no longer. Yeah. No longer. I mean, churches are boxes that look like this warehouse, uh -huh. um, and and so there's a there's a disconnect yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Between the people yeah. who at one time their faith um, was both enriched by and sponsored. Yeah. Some huh. of the greatest works of art. Yeah, yeah. In the history Indeed. of the world. Yeah. And now there's this this total. Yeah. Um, visual, huh. I call it visual illiteracy. Yeah. Huh. Um, and how that, I mean, we can talk about Protestantism. I, yeah. I don't need you to talk about the history. Yeah. But in the contemporary world, where is the space? Because it seems. Ah, I see. Yeah. It seems like people who really believe or claim to, both in, I mean, across the board, I can, Islam as well, because when I look at the work of Muslim artists, and I think of Muslims I know, well, it's not connected. There's, there's some tension so, there, yeah. So, the work, you know, so <laughs> yeah. when you talk about that division Ooh. now between Ooh. the believers, yeah. Yeah. if you can. Ooh. Yes, good. So if you didn't hear that uh, a kind of um, a visual illiteracy yes. within churches and within Christian traditions, uh, how does that relate to In all others, of this? Yeah. Well, um, yes, you're right about that. Um, I, I, I suppose maybe the, maybe the uh, way to say it um, is that, so I, I teach at Duke Divinity School, I teach two classes. One is in contemporary art and theology. That's, a, that's an unusual course to be offering in a divinity school. Yeah. Um, the other course I teach is called Visual Art as Theology that, uh, looks at the history of primarily Christian art um, through the centuries as a domain, primary dom a, a domain of primary theological reasoning and biblical commentary. It is just done in visual spatial terms rather than verbal and written terms. Um, and so we, we are um, learning to think, uh, to, under, to read, to become literate in the visual spatial visual spatial forms of theology, which is one of the main ways that the church has done its theology through the <laughs> centuries. Um, and so I'm quite interested in recovering that uh, theological source for the church. I'm teaching at a divinity school after all. These are you know theologians and pastors and so on. Recovering it for the church, but also recovering it for the um, you know, the broader artistic culture, visual culture, because it's, it's not illustration, and it's not, um, it's not, it's not ornamentation. It is um, quite rigorous reasoning, visual spatial reasoning. 
um, that, as you point out, uh, we've, we, we ha have lost the ability to read it, m maybe because we've gotten so good at um, managing a whole host of visual images. We're so visual that the kind of art that is like, you know, reading, that functions like reading Aquinas, kind of, <laughs> it's hard to read because we read too, too, too fast, something like that. So, so all to, uh, that was just a yes, preach it, uh, I'm working on it. I don't know. <laughs> but that, I'm really interested in that kind of, you know, two, there are two pistons firing at the same time, yeah. Um, how much time do we have? Let's take one more, because I think we're. Okay, who, who, who wants it? Who's this burning question? Yeah, let's do it. I'm going to ask the same question in a different key. So when you went down the four horizons, I'm sitting here as a Christian philosopher thinking, all these people are just assuming these religions are false. You know, they make like truth claims about the world. That's sort of interesting. And then they go on and do their thing like downstream of this assumption. I want to know, so I'm asking, you know, you kind of have the hot take on the, what the artists are thinking and what the mm. art history scholars are thinking and so on. Mm. Is that true? Are they just taking for granted that the worldview of Christianity and similar religions just couldn't be true and then operating downstream of that assumption? And mm. let me put this in a, a little snarkier. Are they at all alive to the fact that there's like this lively, vibrant culture of Christian philosophy uh, <laughs> taking place where people mm. give serious arguments for mm. not just the existence of God, but the specific doctrinal mm. content of Christianity. Mm. Are they at all like mm. aware of mm. this? I mean, I guess this shouldn't surprise me at this point, but I'm rather innocent still, so it, it does surprise me to hear yeah. those assumptions being made. Well, um, to, to so it's hard to make broad generalizations. I think, I think a lot of, I think a lot of um, artists and scholars of art who go through art school aren't, probably aren't, the majority probably aren't terribly aware of the, that vibrant world that you describe. <laughs> the vibrant world of uh, Christian, I mean, are you talking about contemporary Christian philosophy? That's or right. Philosophy, the, the, Christian the philosophy. The Plantingas and the Peter Van Eden yeah, yeah, yeah. and Yeah, probably not so much. Um, Partially because uh, art, in art school, you, I mean, if Plantinga is the example, in art school, you read continental philosophy. There's no analytic, um, very little. Maybe, well, Arthur Danto's kind of, he's the analytic. Um, um, but I think there, there is, um, in, the, in the discipline, there, there is a, there's quite a gap between the disciplines, the way the culture of the disciplines work. So that you can go through art school and you don't, I mean, you just, you don't read any, uh, no, you don't really read, you don't, you don't get very in touch with the, the best thinking going on currently in Christian philosophy and theology. But vice versa, um, the philosophers and theologians tend not to read the best Art criticism and history, uh, uh, art history going uh, being made today, and so there's just there's just kind of a disciplinary gap. There's there's also a a just a cultural gap. They they often don't speak the same languages and uh, run in the same circles, and they spend time in in different in different places with different texts. Um, to your question, so and that's I I see that not as the artist's fault. But uh, just a kind of, you know, uh, some of us are working on that. Like, what would it, what it, would it be like to read, you know, what would it be like to read Bart in a art history class? I mean, that's weird uh, in the discipline, but uh, and it doesn't have to be Bart, uh, Hunters von Balthasar, you know, whoever it might be. Well, contemporary. It should be. Uh, I should think of a current example. Um, uh, but to your question about do, do contemporary artists just assume Christianity is false or that it's not to be taken seriously? I mean, I, th I, think, the, I, th I think the dominant, I think more than anything, you have uh, artists who um, have wounds from 
Christ, Christian upbringing or religious upbringing. I think that's, that's more the issue usually. The, the political, those, those uh, like highly political uh, uh, scholars, the, they're, they're dismantling power that they, that they feel hurt by. I think that's, that's, so I don't think it's dismissive. Uh, that's that you encounter that too, and you encounter just total amnesia about the, the religious history and total lack of knowledge. But um, I, think, I think that there's usually something more complicated and interesting there. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in theological reading of that situation. The, actually, the, the, the wounds are interesting to me. I am interested in reading that and reading it theologically. There's a lot there. And I'm, I'm really interested in anything that avoids the polarizing, <laughs> the, that is just endless in our, in our society and endless in the arts. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, you know, Jonathan, it makes me think a year ago, we hosted a retreat for, um, for African Americans, African American Christians looking into the African sources of Christianity very early. And one of the, the subjects that they had talked about was church hurt. I had never heard the term before. There may be synagogue hurt, there may be mosque hurt, I mean, but church hurt is like a real piece of discourse, at least from all the people who were at that retreat. So we can all talk about that. But life is not easy. I don't know. Where have you been? You know, I mean, like, what? I've got school hurt. I've got church hurt. I've got, you know, doctor hurt because they retire. I've got all kinds of hurt, you know. I mean, so we could... You know, so there's that. But anyway, I thank you all. And one more hand for Jonathan. Thank you. Um, two things, and I'll let you go. Get some coffee or whatever. Um, one is a show that was done originally at Bridge Projects can now be seen at Pepperdine's Weissman Museum. It is To Bow and to Bend, which is an exhibition that was... a that dealt with the fact that trees figure deeply in the origin stories of many world religions. And, well, think of, you know, the Bible. There are these trees in the garden, and there is a problem with one of them. And you can go around, there's the Bodhi tree. Anyway, we'll go on. Hindus have trees. The Norse have Idrisil. There's this huge and deep thing about trees. So to bow and to bend, um, ask contemporary artists to, to look at that fact and also to look at the ecological concerns that grow out of that. And um, two of the artists, well, one of them, I think Tim's not here, um, but um, Patty Whitman is here, here. Her work is in that show. And, um, and Karen Dodd, some of you may remember, um, who did the Ethiopian show of the great photographs of how it's the, the, the Ethiop it's Ethiopian Orthodox theology that has saved the trees or what trees have been saved in Ethiopia because they believe that churches should be built in trees because we came into a garden and we're going to end in a garden city and therefore... It's just like obvious, um, churches should be built in a woods. And so you can look at a map of Ethiopia and find these dark circles, and it's the trees. They have saved them against urbanization and deforestation, and it's anyway in the photographs. So th that work is in that show. It's going to be up through March 26 of next year. You've got plenty of time to go. So please do. And last but not least, the next um, salon that we will have will be the opening of our fall show out of our own gallery. It's called Making a Mark, Abstraction in the Amundsen Collection, because they always say that. At any rate, but they are, they're abstract works of art 
that we have collected, um, curated by John Silvis, October 29. There will be a panel discussion with some of the artists in the show, led by none other than Jonathan Anderson. And um, thank you in advance. And, um, and also then, there will be um, a performance of poetry and music by um, Dana Joya, who some of you know, and Helen Soon, the great jazz pianist, composer, et cetera. Um, then on November 13, we have a return visit from Kyle Harper, Mr. Plague. Um, if you were, came before, well, no, before he, he, lectured, he talked about another book of his, but he has written a book on the history of plagues, and somehow it seems like a pertinent subject. Um, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, so, so I invite you all to come in here, Kyle Harper, who is a professor of classics at the University of Oklahoma. He was the provost, and then he was delivered from that. So he's back to teaching, and his book got finished. And he's also wonderful if you were here before. He's a delightful person. And um, then on, in December, I don't know the date off the top of my head, and I forgot to ask Anne, um, Melanie Penn will be back to do another Christmas concert. So, and we'll see what she's come up with by now. She has officially moved to Nashville. She actually has an apartment, and she's living in it. At least that's what she says. At any rate, so I invite you. You'll get uh, the dates for those as well. I also want to encourage you, if you haven't bought your 10 copies, um, the wonderful Megan Ritchie, who does, I should have in introduced the two of you, Megan Ritchie, who does all the social media for Bridge Projects and other related things, and Vicki um, um, Fung-Smith, who is, right now, they are the Bridge Projects folks. Vicki worked long and hard on, all, on many of these shows. So... Thank you to both of you, and I apologize for waiting till now to introduce you. Um, and also buy your 10 copies of, okay, you got the mint. Anyway, thank you so much for coming, and I hope we'll see you all on the 29th of October. And don't think about the Great Depression of October 29, 1929. Okay, bye.